when I heard Ray Weiss's idea for this kind of a gravitational wave detector, I was one of the people who said, oh, that doesn't make any sense. There's no way you can possibly get to, to that level of uh, precision of measurement. And then after he convinced me that it was possible, I then decided I should spend the rest of my career trying to help him make it happen. And so here I am. Uh, and so he talked, Ray talked about where we stand today. I'll talk about the future of this field. Uh, when the gravitational waves were discovered, the first one approximately one year ago by advanced LIGO, the detector was at one-third of its design sensitivity. Uh, and we were, have seen three black holes emerge, as Ray described to you, uh, and a period of four months. So that's roughly one uh, disc black hole merger a month at this sensitivity. When we reach the design sensitivity around 2019 to 2020, these detectors, the, the strategy is that you search for a few months, then you shut down, and for half a year or so, uh, you work hard, the, the team works hard to remove the noise and uh, get the detectors closer to design sensitivity, then search again, and the second search has just barely begun. Uh, and uh, by 2019, 2020, the team should be at advanced sen at, uh, design sensitivity, and so should be seeing uh, three times farther into the universe, because the detector is three times better. So you see a volume of the universe three cubed times larger. That's about 30 times higher. You multiply one a month by a factor of 30, one a day. One black hole merger per day around 2019, 2020. Uh, but we expect to see other sources of gravitational waves by the time we reach design sensitivity. We expect to see neutron stars, stars about the size of San Francisco, with masses about one and a half times as high as the mass of the sun, spinning with little mountains on their surfaces, to speak heuristically, deformations from axial symmetry that emit uh, periodic gravitational waves. We expect to see black holes tear apart companion neutron stars. We expect to see two neutron stars go around each other collide and merge, uh, producing a lot of electromagnetic radiation as well. And so electromagnetic observations, coincidence with our observations, are going to be crucial. In fact, uh, we already see, gamma ray astronomers already see gamma ray bursts that are thought to come from neutron star mergers. And so it will be wonderful to see the mergers themselves through gravitational waves as well as the electromagnetic waves that accompany them. Uh, if we're lucky, we will see a supernova that is close enough to Earth in a nearby galaxy uh, that the gravitational waves can be seen, and that will enable us through combined observations of gravitational waves and neutrinos to diagnose just what goes on in the core of the supernova explosion to make the explosion actually go off, to understand the central engine. But most important of all, every time a new type of uh, radiation has been used for astronomy, say, going from light to radio waves to x-rays, there have been huge surprises. The universe looked in light like it was a quiescent universe. In radio waves, it looked very violent. With x-rays, we, for the first time, saw black holes and neutron stars or evidence of them. And gravitational waves are radically different from any of the previous kinds of radiation because instead of being made of oscillating electric and magnetic fields, they're made out of, uh, os out of oscillating ripples in the fabric of space and time. And uh, so there will be huge surprises with gravitational waves. We have uh, on the design boards and know how to build the LIGO team an improvement that might go in as early as 2025 called Voyager, which would be good enough that we would, for black hole mergers, to be seeing a few per hour with masses less than, the mass, uh, than a thousand times the mass of the sun, and then a follow-on uh, design, which will involve lengthening the arms from four kilometers to 40 kilometers, which could get another uh, factor of uh, three to four in distance that you can see, to the point where we could see all the black holes that are emerging in the entire universe out to, uh, up to masses of about a thousand solar masses. Now, as Ray advertised, there are deep issues in being able to make these measurements. And one of the reasons I was skeptical at first is that at the level of advanced LIGO, we will be, uh, uh, the team will be monitoring the motions of the center of masses of these mirrors using laser light at a level of precision 
that is the, the, at the same level as the quantum fluctuations in the motion of the center of mass. 40 kilogram objects we will see move and obey the laws of quantum physics, not classical physics. The quantum physics that we've only seen previously at the scale of atoms and molecules and beginning to see it with nanostructures. But we will see it with 40 kilogram uh, uh, objects. And in the third generation, the Voyagers, we will be down at a third the level of the quantum fluctuation. So the first time humans will see human-sized objects behave quantum mechanically. And in order to deal with this, we have had to develop something called quantum non-demolition technology. It's a branch of quantum information science. So quantum computers and quantum cryptography are the better known aspects of this. Uh, but the issue is how do you get a highly classical gravitational wave signal through quantum mechanical particles, each of which weighs about 40 kilograms, unscathed. And so that technology is in hand and will begin to be implemented, in fact, most likely next year in advanced LIGO. Now, we ha with electromagnetic waves, we look with light, with x-rays, with radio waves. Each of these differs in the wavelength of the light, or equivalently, in the oscillation period. Similarly, with gravitational waves, we will have the analogs of light, radio waves, x-rays, each with different oscillation periods. So we have all already, with LIGO, opened up the gravitational wave uh, frequencies in the millisecond uh, period, basically t 100 to uh, 10 uh, uh, milliseconds, I'm sorry, uh, 100, 100 milliseconds up to a tenth of a millisecond, a huge frequency band has now been opened by LIGO. Uh, in uh, about 2030, uh, we expect that an analog of LIGO that involves three spacecraft that track each other with laser beams uh, will go into operation uh, and uh, it will look for gravitational waves with periods of minutes to hours. That's 10,000 times longer periods than LIGO. It's the same ratio as radio waves to light. Sometime, probably within the next five to 10 years, another technique will succeed, uh, and which involves looking at pulsars, spinning neutron stars, which give you very regular pulses at different locations on the sky. And when the gravitational wave sweeps across the Earth, it speeds up and slows down our clocks on Earth. So the pulsars appear to speed up and slow down synchronously. And when that is seen, that will be due to gravitational waves. And with that technique, we should see gravitational waves with periods of years to decades. And then there's a technique I'll talk about in a few moments uh, that will see gravitational waves with periods of billions of years. That's longer than a graduate student lifetime, so you're not seeing it by watching it oscillate. Uh, this is with something called uh, this cosmic microwave background polarization. I'll return to that at the end of the, uh, my talk. I want to use my remaining time by describing two areas of science that uh, are particularly exciting to me that are going to be major aspects of gravitational wave astronomy and cosmology in the uh, coming years. First, exploring black holes with gravitational waves. Obviously, we've already begun to do that. But particularly interesting to me is what can be done with LISA, the uh, space-based version, with this, uh, the uh, spacecraft separated by distances of millions of, uh, of kilometers uh, tracked with laser beams. We th with that, we'll be able to map the space-time curvature of quiescent black holes just like uh, uh, people have mapped the surface of Mars or uh, even the surface of Venus uh, through the clouds. And the basic issue is that black holes are made from warped space and time, not from matter like you and I. And you can visualize the warping uh, by taking a two-dimensional slice through the black hole, say through its equator, and then looking in, uh, and that is a, uh, then gives you a two-dimensional surface that is highly curved, warped, uh, it doesn't look like a flat sheet of paper, and you can visualize that by embedding it in a higher dimensional space, uh, say a, th a three-dimensional flat space. And it will look something like this. You go out far away, and this goes flat. It comes down, and there's a throat, and down here is a circle, uh, which is the horizon. It looks like a circle because I've removed one dimension. It's really a spheroid, a flattened sphere. Uh, that's the horizon. You go beyond that, and you can't get out. And uh, so the shape of this is the warping of space. The color coding is the slowing of time. 
at the yellow point, time is flowing at 10% of the rate that it does uh, back here on Earth. And at the black point, the horizon, time slows to a halt. And the uh, white shows the dragging of space into whirling motion like air in a tornado. We call it dragging of inertial frames. Now, uh, we want to map that space-time geometry for black holes with ultra, ultra high precision, as has been done for the surface of Mars. How will we do it? We uh, will look at black holes, say, with 10 million solar masses, uh, uh, very big black holes in the centers of galaxies. A small black hole, say, 10 times as heavy as the sun, orbits around it and very gradually spirals in and obviously creates ripples in the shape of space and time as it goes. And those ripples travel out. Those are gravitational waves. And uh, by collecting the data from this, for over a period of a year or two, we will be able to build up a very high precision map. The full map of this uh, space-time geometry of the big black hole is encoded in the gravitational waves that are produced. And you get some sense of why that is. As I said, we will uh, measure these waves with LISA. If you look at the uh, motion of the small black hole around the big black hole, now having removed the uh, warping of space from this, these orbits are nothing like Keplerian orbits, nothing like the orbits of the planets around our sun, because the gravitational field is so ultra strong, space and time are so highly warped. The small black hole samples the entire space around the big black hole, sending off waves that encode in them the full space-time geometry. Now, what if the central body is not a black hole? Well, the map will look wrong. And we will then begin to explore what kinds of other massive objects might there be uh, at centers of galaxies, if there are any, uh, that uh, uh, a small object can orbit around. And so it'll be a business of searching and, uh, and exploring the universe in this way. There may be no others, but there might be. There are speculations. The other thing that is particularly interesting for, to me is to explore the dynamics of uh, warped space-time for colliding black holes. And the way that we do this, and have already done it with the first gravitational wave detection, is you look at the grave, wave shapes, you compare with computer simulations, and you identify just what the properties of the, words, the black holes were that produced the gravitational waves. And then you go to the computer and say, what did the uh, shape of space and time do uh, to produce those waves? And here you can see we slow into slow motion. And it's like a storm at sea, a violent, wild oscillation in the shape of space. It's uh, growing up here like a gigantic wave in a storm at sea. And the color coding is the slowing of time and then an oscillation in the speed of time. And then it settles back down. And in that process, three solar masses of energy go off in gravitational waves with more luminosity, more power than all the stars in the universe put together. Well, finally, what we expect to be doing is to exploring the birth of the universe. If you look at the universe with photons, photons coming off of the Big Bang could not propagate when the universe was uh, uh, very young. The universe had to be a few hundred thousand years old before the uh, plasma of the early universe had cooled down enough and recombined so that photons could propagate. Earlier than one second, neutrinos couldn't propagate because the universe was too hot and dense. Uh, and going way back to the beginning, gravitational waves are the only form of radiation that is so penetrating that it could be produced at the Planck era, when space and time were created, uh, when the Big Bang uh, uh, was, uh, occurred, and bring us information from that era about the birth of the universe. And so, in fact, I expect that to, within the next few decades, the central theme, or a central theme, of this field is going to be exploring the first one second of the life of the universe. I'll give you three quick examples, and then I'll quit. It is believed uh, with uh, strong, uh, strong evidence that the, in the earliest moments of the universe, the ex universe expanded extremely rapidly in what is called inflation. Whatever came off the Big Bang would have been, according to theory, amplified enormously during inflation to give us a rich background spectrum of gravitational waves. Those waves travel out, and at the uh, time when the plasma is recombining to let photons propagate for the first time, these photons, which are now cosmic microwave background radiation, these photons acquired a polarization 
uh, that is uh, produced by the gravitational waves stretching and squeezing the plasma at the time that the last scattering occurred. And that polarization is observed uh, by, uh, uh, has been seen, but there is noise in the data due to some background that has, needs to be uh, uh, understood and removed. And I expect that within five to 10 years, this will be solved. And we will be seeing then the, gravitation, the imprint of the gravitational waves from the earliest moments of the universe. Uh, when the universe was 10 to the minus 12 seconds old, the electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force, which were combined earlier when the universe was hotter, came apart. And the electric and magnetic forces uh, began to exist for the first time. And this ha may have occurred inside bubbles in what is known as the first order phase transition. If that is the case, then you have a bubble where you have an electromagnetic force and the background where it doesn't even exist. And the bubbles, according to theory, expand at the speed of light, collide, produce gravitational waves. Those gravitational waves today are in Lisa's domain. And so Lisa will be going after trying to see these waves. LIHO could see similar phase transitions at an age when the universe was 10 to the minus 22 seconds old. We have no idea what the physics of the universe was at 10 to the minus 22 seconds, but uh, that's what LIGO could probe. Finally, there are things called uh, cosmic strings, defects in the structure of space uh, that uh, pro possibly produced in the birth of the universe that uh, kink or bend in the uh, string can produce gravitational waves. LIGO is even searching for these, but LISA and pulsar time will be able to search for them better. And so in conclusion, gravitational waves, in fact, will be a major tool for astronomy into the next century, probably in the next few centuries. And this is why this has been so exciting for us. And uh, for me as a theorist, a, a driving force in my career is the idea to open up this new tool which will have a very long-lasting impact on our understanding of the universe. Thank you.